Good afternoon, Singapore, and good morning, Norway. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Susanna Quack. On behalf of Innovation Norway, I'm happy to welcome you on board this webinar on circular economy. I shall now invite our commercial counselor and director of Innovation Norway, Paul Kasman, to deliver the welcome remarks. Paul, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to day two of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference and this session on smart urban solutions. My name is Paul Kastman and I'm the Director of Innovation Norway in Singapore. Innovation Norway constitutes the commercial and science section of the Norwegian Embassy in Singapore and we work closely with uh, Norwegian business uh, as well as Norwegian research institutions as well as their counterparts in, uh, in Singapore. Um, I'm also the chairman of Nordic Innovation House here in Singapore, that some of you might know, and I'm on the board together with Leonard Sturness in uh, NBUS. Uh, for, you, for those of you that followed yesterday's program, uh, we addressed some of the global challenges that are shaping our time and how uh, Singapore and Norway are working with the green transition. The main takeaway, I think, is the need for urgency. Um, and on the flip side, uh, with large challenges, also come large opportunities. How can smart, sustainable solution help solve these challenges? Today, we will look at uh, specific problem statements within the maritime and urban dimensions. And we have decided to run two parallel sessions to do the topics justice. Uh, one is addressing maritime digitalization and decarbonization. That is the other session, not this one. And then there is this session which looks at circular economy in an urban setting. Now, circular economy is a broad topic and we have chosen to target two specific segments. We will look at how we can attain a circular economy through the establishment of a deposit return scheme or pantone, as we call it in Norwegian. Uh, what we have learned from DRS implemented in other countries around the world is important. What are the criteria underpinning a future DRS system in Singapore, as well as the Southeast Asia region at large? Um, we will also look at uh, urban food waste management. Uh, Singapore has an ambition of 30 by 30, which means that 30% of all the food consumed here in Singapore uh, should be produced domestically. Um, today, this number is less than 10%, so that target is quite ambitious. It should happen within the next nine years. Like Singapore and Norway, most countries have an ambitious ambition to implement a more efficient management of food and organic waste. Uh, today, a lot of it is incinerated, which is also the case here in Singapore. And uh, this will obviously have to change if Singapore is to reach its target of 30% uh, domestically produced food by 2030. Uh, we will look at the alternative uses of food waste and uh, the kind of byproducts that you can use and produce from uh, the waste. How can we utilize more food uh, that we produce? Um, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our fellow Team Norway partners in this event, the Embassy and NBUS as well as our local partners, the panelists, and not least the moderators. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I'd like to give the word to the president of AMBAS, Leonard Stolmes. Leo, the floor is yours. A very warm welcome to the second day of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference. We live in a world with constant changes and high level of uncertainties, but we are all aware of the driving forces within our societies and the operating environment with clear trends towards digitalization, decarbonization, alternative fuel, focus on sustainability, circular economy, clean recycling, and the handling of food waste. These are all areas of expertise where many Norwegian companies and universities have core knowledge and experience and should in many respects be natural partners for the authorities and businesses in Singapore. I therefore hope that the discussions today will help in the process with developing synergies between Singapore and Norway, as Singapore also has a lot to offer Norway. If you are not yet connected to the Norwegian Business Association, but would like to know more, reach out to us and we look forward to have a conversation with you. I would like to thank Innovation Norway 
and the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Singapore for the very good cooperation during the planning and organizing of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference. And I hope that you all find value in the topic and discussions that will be on the agenda today. Thank you. Yeah, a very good afternoon and a good morning from uh, myself too. My name is Corrado Christian Lilleron Forcellati, and it is truly a privilege and an honor for me to introduce the keynote speaker for today, Professor Seram Ramakrishna. Uh, I know you are passionate about circular economy. Uh, you told me before that you keep learning, but allow us today to have you as a professor and enlightening us. Uh, professor Seram is a fellow uh, of the Royal Academy of Engineering. He's the chairman of Plastics Recycling Center of Excellence of the Plastics Recycling Association of Singapore. He's a member of the Extended Producer Responsibility Committee of Ministry of the environment of sustainability and the environment uh, alongside NEA. So I think you have a number of credentials that make you truly an expert. Uh, and what I also find fascinating, your book about circular economy uh, has gained a lot of attention. You have been awarded the 2021 Springer Nature China Development Award. You have been recognized as, as a thought leader uh, and one of the you know, most influential mindset or minds by Thomson Reuters. So Professor Saram, I have only uh, to ask you to take the stage and uh, give us your keynote speech. Thank you so much. Thank you, <clears throat> Corrado, for uh, having me on your panel and inviting me to deliver keynote lecture. Excellencies, panelists, moderators, virtual audience, a good afternoon to all of you. As the chairman of Plastic Recycling Center of Excellence and a board member of Plastic Recycling Association of Singapore, I convey our sincere appreciation to the Norwegian Business Association Singapore for organizing this Norway-Singapore Innovation Conference 2021 with a theme very close to my heart, circular economy. Sustainable circular economy is vital to Singapore as well as the rest of the world. I'm glad to report that Norwegian company Tomra is a member of PRAS and at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology signed an MOU with PRCOE to partner in the areas of plastic circular economy. Singapore is hastening efforts to transform into a net zero, climate resilient, sustainable circular economy. Awareness of human activities cause global warming and social costs is now far greater than COP1 held in 1995 in Germany. A recent survey of over 500 businesses and consumers revealed that consumers expect businesses to put more environmental concerns ahead of profits. Key motivators for the businesses to move towards net zero emissions were regulations, financial market pressure, and climate-related risk. About 96% of the consumers said they had been affected by the climate change, yet cost and convenience were their concerns when it comes to making greener choices. In other words, public want climate action while they remain ambivalent on personal responsibility. In the case of governments, as well as corporations, there is a gap between their pledges and effective implementation. Last one year, countries around the world already experienced the impact of climate change. And the world leaders are getting ready to attend COP26, going to be held towards end of this month in UK. 
COP26 is about coercing countries to deeper cooperation to secure global net zero emissions by mid-century and achieve 1.5 degrees within the reach. Global community is asked to invest much more and raise the speed and scale of its pledges to emission reductions by 2030, as well as attaining net zero by 2050. On this note, I like to highlight, we must ask the countries as well as corporations also specify materials consumption, meaning total materials and chemicals in an economy, a reduction of them, and material decarbonization targets in respect to climate actions for the following reasons. More than 100 billion tons of materials are used in 2017 to build homes and infrastructure, provide consumer goods, electronic goods, fashion, food, water, energy, transportation, and generate power. About 23% of global emissions in 2020 are attributed to material production. Correspondingly, the global material footprint increased by 70%. Recent studies have shown that going forward, countries as well as corporations must factor true environmental and social costs of materials. because there are not enough resources and environmental capacity of Earth to provide projected increase in the world population from the current 7.7 .7 billion to 9.7 billion by 2050. Fulfilling their demand for better standards of living, higher consumption, require natural resources equivalent of several planet Earths. Circular economy is desirable alternative to the linear economy. If the world economy embraces circular economy strategies and increases circularity from the current 8.6 to 17%, the world will reduce global emissions by 39% and material footprint by 28%. As an island nation, Singapore has always been aware of the need to balance economic development and environmental sustainability. To overcome the limitations of land and the land filling sites, Singapore embraced Green Plan 2030, which is a whole of nation effort to, to build a sustainable circular economy. Five key pillars of Singapore Green Plan 2030 are city in nature, sustainable living, energy reset, green economy, and resilient future. In other words, Green Plan aims to reduce the waste sent to the landfill per capita per day by 20% by 2026, with the goal of reaching 30% by 2030. The landmark Resource Sustainability Act, RSA in short, was enacted in 2019 to give the legislative effect to the regulatory measures targeting the entire three priority solid waste streams of Singapore, electronic waste, food waste, packaging waste that includes plastics. RSA enabled the introduction of extended producer responsibility our EPR framework. The framework mandates producers and suppliers of regulated products to be responsible for the collection and proper treatment and disposal with the safe handling and extraction of valuable resources from the waste. An example of EPR framework has already been implemented in the e-waste management from July, 2021. Moving forward, 2024, Singapore would be introducing EPR concept for the food waste as well. <clears throat> as a precursor to the planned EPR framework, 
for packaging waste that includes plastics by 2025, Singapore commenced mandatory packaging reporting framework from this year, January. Under this framework, producers of packaged products will be required to submit packaging data as well as three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle plans to the National Environmental Agency. Packaging waste, including plastics, is one of the Singapore's priority waste streams to, due to high rates of generation and low rates of recycling. <clears throat> At the launch of PROS in August 2021, Minister Grace Fu said, in developing and expanding our recycling capabilities for plastic waste, Singapore will implement a beverage container returns, return scheme as the first phase of EPR for packaging waste. Producers such as the beverage companies will be accountable for a collection recycling of their beverage bottles. Consumers will get a refund when they return the empty beverage containers at designated return points. This scheme is aimed to increase the collection of plastic waste and support the plastic recycling industry in Singapore. Towards this end, NEA will be implementing deposit refund scheme, DRS, for beverage containers by 2022 as the first phase of EPR approach for packaging waste management. It has been noted that DR has been implemented in several countries, including our partners, Norway and Sweden and Germany, achieving high recycling rates of beverage containers over 80%. Successful DRS will catalyze plastic recycling industry in Singapore. Packaging and plastic weights are often heterogeneous and require a range of solutions. Mechanical recycling, chemical recycling, or complementary methods for closing the plastics loop and achieving higher circularity. Waste collection is a critical step in managing the waste. For effective recycling, identification, sorting, segregation of plastic waste are necessary. Watermarking, digital marking, or molecular labeling of plastics is a useful solution. Coupled with fourth industrial revolution technologies, will further strengthen our waste management solutions. They must be augmented with eco-friendly design of products, enhancing materials efficiency of products, life cycle engineering, sourcing of plastics from renewable and local sources, additive-free plastics, zero social costs of plastics, microbial valorization via bioengineered enzymes, and so on. In order to achieve highest circularity of plastics with low carbon footprint, further research and innovations via reimagining molecules is also envisaged. What else is necessary to realize a sustainable circular economy. Let us delve into this aspect via plastics example. One of the tenets of circular economy is prevention and reduction of materials use. There are limits to this tenet as evidenced by the essential role of plastics in dealing with COVID-19 pandemic. World generates 300 million tons of plastic waste every year only 9% is recycled and 12% is incinerated, 79% is accumulated in the nature around the world. Improved waste management methods certainly will enhance recycling rates.
circular economy must be undergirded with other measures such as suitable for sustainable future. For example, greater efficiency in industrial processes will lower the material footprint by 10%. Further gains can be realized by optimizing interdependencies across industry and economies. Embracing sound solid waste management thoroughly vetted by the environmental and social costs. Innovating materials as the sinks of emissions and further making efforts to minimize the consumption and environmental impact on planet Earth, which seems to have a hard limits. Reducing materials carbon footprint, enhancing circularity requires innovations at atomic molecular chemistry and biology of different materials. It is important to develop credible evidences to avoid efforts dismissed as greenwashing. Often, greenwashing leads to unintended counterproductive outcomes, if not properly assessed in terms of sustainability and practical feasibility. This, <clears throat> this calls for a deeper understanding of the trade-offs across materials carbon footprint, circularity, recyclability, waste reduction, environmental effects, and social costs. In closing, i like to summarize. Circular economy presents many new opportunities for Singapore, as well as our international partners. As the management of solid waste affects every human being. Realization of circular economy transition requires active, meaningful partnerships among all stakeholders, especially the government, business community, research community, and international partners. No stakeholder alone can transform into a net zero sustainable circular economy. The need for a circular economy is rising in the region viable and effective solutions for sustainable growth and development are in demand. On this note, I'd like to wish you all a candid, fruitful discussions on sustaining circular economy so as to build back a greener world. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested, my speech which is written is available to the conference organizers so that you can verify uh, more information uh, that led to my speech. I'd like to thank Prado for uh, chairing the session and the opportunity to deliver this keynote. Thank you, Prado. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, uh, Prof. Saram, I think there are many good points that you brought up uh, and setting the scene to the panel discussion, uh, I think what made me reflect a bit, you mentioned that, you know, 23% of global emissions in 2020 are actually attributable, attributable to uh, uh, material production. And, and that circular economy, uh, besides bringing the benefit in terms of reducing those emissions, uh, do have restorative uh, capabilities if we are able to close the loop. Uh, and that is one of the points that I'm sure I'm going to discuss with my speakers today uh, on on uh, on the DRS in particular. Uh, and I think this is particularly important. Uh, and we see that uh, perfectly captured in the uh, Singapore Green Plan, uh, where the focus is also on, as you mentioned, Professor, on reducing recycling and reusing materials, in particular plastic uh, being being the stream. Uh, of interest um, in, in order for, for Singapore to uh, create a secondary market for, for uh, plastic in particular. The DRS, just to uh, uh, give a context uh, before uh, introducing my panelists, uh, is part already of the Zero Master Plan. Uh, is also the first, Singapore is the first country in, in Asia to introduce a DRS. So we are also excited to see how the DRS and how Singapore can be of inspiration uh, and uh, create some larger implication or to your point opportunities that are stretching beyond the Singapore. 
uh, and thereby much more uh, pertaining to the region and uh, helping catalyzing as well uh, interest in terms of competencies, but also industrial interest around plastic recycling in, 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 in you know, more specifically. With great excitement, I would say I would like uh, to introduce my panel for today, uh, starting with Bing from Pomra, followed by Hui Leng from Zero Waste, Thomas from the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, and finally Shell Olaf uh, from uh, Infinitum. And Shell Olaf, if I can start handing the stage over to you for a short introduction of yourself and Infinitum, um, and followed by Hui Lang, Bing, and Thomas. And then we will start the discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, and uh, everyone. And first of all, thank you for the invitation to this uh, interesting conference. Uh, my name is Hirula Maldim. I'm Managing Director for Infinitum. That's the company responsible for the DRS in Norway. Uh, my background before I started in Infinitum in 2007, I was working uh, for a, a company that was responsible for the environmental work for the retail chain in Norway. So I was working six years and we started to look into the logistics. And then we saw that we need to do a lot of things with the packaging for the grocery goods. So I was working with that in six years. And before that, I was working at National Institute of Technology. Uh, and we were looking into electrical vehicle and, uh, and uh, alternative fuels. But then we saw that maybe the most important for, uh, part, uh, most important projects was to look into the, the yield, the use of the, the trucks, the logistics. So then we started to look inside the truck and start working with the packaging and the use of the packaging and so on. Today I'm talking about the uh, Infinitum uh, and give you a short presentation uh, for how we do the operation. Let's take the next slide. Uh, yeah. So Infinitum uh, is a DRS and like the other DRS in the Nordic and Baltic countries, we are one operating uh, operator covering the whole country. So when the producer, they um, make a product, uh, beverage or beer, they put it into a uh, beverage packaging, can or PET or HDP bottle. Then they become a member of Infinitum and uh, we look into the packaging and say, okay, this is applicable with our recycling process. So we have focus on the PET bottle, what type of glue label and so on to ensure high yield in the recycling process. Then the producer are allowed to put the product on the market. The consumer empty the packaging and deliver back the packaging because they only borrow the packaging. It's important to get the material back into the loop. They go to a shop where they have a reverse vending machine or to a kiosk or gasoline station, a small corner shop without a reverse vending machine. They deliver back the empties. The shop, they will put the empties uh, in the bag. If you have a reverse vending machine, the compaction, then it's uh, compacted. All the units are registered on the barcode and shape, so it's very uh, accurate <coughs> counting on the units. Then the shop uh, prepare the bag and we will pick it up and take it into our uh, logistic hub <clears throat> to the sorting and bailing plant that we have. So we separate PET from uh, aluminium and then, then we color sort uh, PET bottles. And then it's transported to uh, the recycler and the material is prepared to be reused in the uh, beverage packaging. And we cover all the costs for the total operation. We pay for the, the service that the shop do when they invest in our reverse vending machine, the area they use and the workforce and so on. We cover all the logistics. So when you buy a product in Norway on a beverage packaging, if it's a can of PT, all costs are included for the take back of the empties uh, and so on. So next slide. Um, so in Norway, we said that uh, the system is a 100% producer responsibility system since all costs are covered and the producer are responsible for the operation. Next slide. Infinitum, in short uh, figures, we call it a private-owned value chain company. It's non-for-profit, but I don't like the terms because it's easy to be non-profit. What's important is to make it efficient. So we also been look up on, uh, from the authority that we are extended part of the producer's responsibility. It's owned 50-50 by the producer and the retailer. The operation started 3rd of May 1999, but we have had DRS uh, since 1902 
I come back to the reason why Infinitum was established in 1999. It's around 1 1.4 billion cans and bottles in 2020. In 2021, we see we are going up to um, almost 1.7 billion cans and bottles. It's around 22,000 tons of PET. And today, we can supply about 80% recycled content in all PET bottles in Norway. And we can do that year in and year out based on the uh, deposit rate and the yield in the recycling process. Same goes for aluminium, and we have around 11,000 tons of aluminium. Next. So we claim that. Infinitum runs a material pool system for aluminum and PET. So when the industry use all of our material, it's a reusable system with the lowest environmental impact. We see there's a lot of uh, discussion, and I think in a lot of market, you also have refillable bottles in the old terms that you take it back, wash it, and fill it up again. Our system is also a refillable system, but have a lower environmental impact. Next slide. This is an important question to ask. What's the problem? We see a lot of politicians are focused on the littering. We think it's important to look at the resources. How can you deliver a product or service at the lowest environmental impact possible? That's important because uh, the population is growing and they have to be much more efficient regarding service and product deliveries. Next. Then it's uh, important to see what can you bring back to the market. We also see a lot of discussion about uh, recycling rate, how much, uh, and then they stated that that's what you take back from the market. But how can you achieve the highest environmental impact? Uh, and that's uh, the collection rate you need to collect all that's put on the market. And then it's important to have a clean, good quality on the material, good control of the material before it's put on the market. So you know it's recyclable and that you can recycle, with, recycle it in an uh, efficient way with a high yield. Next. And of course, if you also focus on the cost per unit, we claim that the lower the cost is for the producer or consumer, the more efficient the system is. And of course, this has to do with the logistics. The more efficient you are on the logistics, the lower the cost, the lower the environmental impact from the system as well. And of course, good quality material with a high yield, you get a good income from the sales of the material you have collected and prepared for reuse. Next. Yes. Uh, in Norway, we have a particular solution. In all the Nordic and Baltic countries, we have the policy system. But in Norway, it's a special setup because in the 90s, when, uh, when countries around the world stopped uh, using DRS because they shifted from a refillable glass bottle to non refillable PET bottle, then we saw it will become a <coughs> littering problem. But in Norway, the politicians established an environmental cost model. They said if you are putting a bat bottle or can into the market with no collection system, you have to pay a very high cost per unit. And it's extremely high cost. It's around 35,000 ton, uh, 35,000 euro per ton of aluminum or 100,000 euro per ton of PT that you have to pay uh, to the tax authority in Norway if you don't have a collection system. So then the industry sat down around the table together with the retailer and discussed, okay, what should we do? We have an old uh, DRS system for the refillable. Should we go into other system? And then next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, and then we saw that we have a different setup for the um, for uh, packaging, so we can compete with a different system, uh, but still they are um, able to run uh, in parallel. But most of the producer they won't be want to be a part of our system. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Shell Olaf. Huilang, can I ask you to go next? Yes, certainly. Hi, everyone. I'm Huilang from Zero Waste SG. So, yes, good afternoon to those in Singapore and good morning to those in uh, Norway. Very happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, uh, just to tell you a little bit about Zero Waste SG, we are a non-governmental organization, NGO and charity in Singapore, driving zero waste actions uh, through education and advocacy. And our main focus areas are in food waste, plastic waste, of course, um, household recycling, as well as organization waste. So in our outreach efforts, I think we work really closely with corporates to deep dive into their uh, work processes to see how we can uh, perhaps eliminate or minimize waste uh, through uh, uh, more efficient work processes. And on the public front, um, we also look at uh, 
you know, how can we interface with publics to uh, raise awareness on uh, issues on waste, uh, on actions to, to reduce waste. Um, I don't have any slides for the DRS uh, per se. I thought uh, maybe we can have a longer discussion uh, at the panel and also with the audience. Uh, but I think just to uh, maybe uh, give some points from our perspective on, on the DRS, um, I think it's, uh, it's useful to look at the DRS or Deposit Refund Scheme uh, as part of the EPR, the Extended Producer uh, Responsibility. Uh, I think it's important that, that uh, producers do have oversight over the, um, the energy or yeah, the carbon footprint uh, you know, of the whole life cycle of their products. I think um, what will be interesting to also talk about and, and hopefully expand a little bit more later on is the role that uh, you know, stakeholders like the individuals or consumers um, can play and, and have to play in this uh, ecosystem to, to ensure that uh, you know, the implementation of such a scheme is, um, is uh, smooth and actually successful. So I think with that, I'll just leave it there and uh, yeah, look forward definitely to exchanging views later on. Thank you. Thank you, Hui Leng. Welcome to the panel. Bing, please. Thank you, Corrado. Thank you, Innovation Norway and BUS for having me. So my name is Bing. Um, at Tomra, I'm heading our collection uh, business in Asia, so where we focus on how to get hold of more valuable material in the first place. I have a background um, in a cross-section of environmental engineering and finance, which I think uh, DRS is also a lot about. Uh, I'm a Norwegian Chinese, so it means I have Asian roots, but I also grew up um, returning, punting uh, empty bottles. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so just briefly uh, on Tomra. Um, Tomra's story started back in 1972, uh, where two brothers in Norway invented the world's first reverse vending machine. Uh, after a local grocery um, asked them to help to collect empty glass containers. So we have kept, uh, kept the innovation spirit um, until uh, this day today. Uh, Tomra has built a successful growth story today. We employ more than 4,300 people uh, with an annual turnover of close to 10 billion Norwegian kroners. Next, please. So I don't need to spend too long time to explain why it's so important to focus on resources. Um, thankfully, Professor Serum has touched enough on this. Um, and of course, we know that resources, they are finite. Um, so Tomra have really made it our vision to try to tackle uh, the waste problem. Um, and of course, we also know that plastics is definitely one of the main areas we should focus. So therefore, Tomra has also pledged to enable 40% um, uh, of all the plastic packaging to be recycled. Um, and then hopefully we can also achieve 30% um, of the plastic being recycled in a closed loop. So, uh, and of course we know that we cannot um, do this alone, but we really would like to support um, to this journey and to reduce the world's reliance on fossil fuels. So next, please. So how are we uh, going to contribute? Tomra has a really unique uh, positioning uh, in the recycling value chain. We are present in the collection, which is the first step in every recycling process by providing advanced reverse vending machines to take back empty beverage containers. Um, after uh, getting hold of the material, we are also doing um, advanced sensor-based sorting of that material to enable high quality uh, recycling. So for now, I'll briefly dive into uh, more on the collection side. Next, please. Tomra uh, provides uh, more than 80,000 reverse vending installations uh, in more than 40 markets um, globally. Um, and as you see, we actually collect um, more than 40 billion containers annually. You might think this is a big number, but in fact, this only accounts for less than 3% of all the beverage containers sold in the world. So this simply means that there is still a big um, opportunity um, for us to come. We typically operate in markets uh, where there are deposit return schemes in place. 
and we see that uh, the DRS is a very effective tool um, to increase the recycling rate and also enable closed loop uh, recycling. So therefore, we are also very excited and would like to contribute to the success of um, DRS introduction in Singapore. Next. And we do have some um, visions too. Um, so we have basically asked ourselves the question, why are some um, deposit return markets um, in the world succeeding while others are failing? So we would like to bring um, our long-term experience and knowledge um, also to share this with Singapore when Singapore is about to introduce DRS um, for the first time. But we also acknowledge that um, every DRS is different um, and the DRS in Singapore will need to cater for the unique demographics, the consumer preferences, the consumption patterns, etc. for Singapore. So we really would like to combine our global expertise uh, with local presence to contribute to the success. And finally, we also see that Singapore is leading um, the way with its Green Plan uh, 2030 commitments. Uh, and we see the importance of success in Singapore to have a very positive spillover effect for rest of the region so that we can contribute to a sustainable living um, for all. Finally, turn to my uh, final page. I just have one small teaser for our newly established Tomra Resource Transformation Center. So this is an experience center um, where we would like to engage and empower all stakeholders to play their part in a more sustainable living. Um, so here we hope that the visitors, they can simulate a DRS journey. They can trial out our uh, different type of reverse vending machines um, with seamless digital integration. So we really hope to welcome all of you there um, and we can promise a rewarding experience. And because after all, recycling should be a rewarding experience. Thank you. Bing, thank you so much and welcome to the panel. Finally, Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for, for this opportunity. Um, so I'm Thomas Choa. I'm a senior advisor to the Alliance in Plastic Waste. Um, I've been with the organization since its inception, uh, which is only just over two years ago. So this is a relatively uh, young and upcoming uh, organization. Um, it is a not-for-profit um, with a global mandate. Um, so uh, with this uh, material, I'll try and explain a little bit more as we go along. So next, please. Um, I think we all know the challenge around the world, which I think uh, other panelists have already um, shared some of those challenges. Uh, suffice to say, I think this is a global problem, right? It's a global concern, just like um, climate change is, um, and it ties in actually quite well. Um, the two are interlinked, um, and I, um, I hope uh, the audience in this, uh, in this uh, webinar um, can share that burden of um, having to do something rather drastically in order to change um, the, the, uh, the challenge that we have, in, not only in our oceans, but in the environment generally. Uh, next, please. So um, back in, at the beginning of uh, 2019, um, 27 founding CEOs of global um, massive you know, companies have got together and basically said that you know, as um, value, plastic value chain industry players, they cannot just sit back and watch um, the plastic waste problem in the environment. So the industry basically feels that they have to be part of the solution rather than um, just being, you know, a supplier or just being a producer or just being a participant in the plastic value chain. Um, so these CEOs have the foresight and have the vision uh, to take on their role and uh, leadership role in terms of um, finding solutions um, to what is, um, as we all agree, um, a global problem. So they set a target to raise um, one and a half billion US dollars. Um, today, we've already um, raised over a billion uh, US dollars in order to um, 
do what they have set up the alliance uh, to end plastic waste to do. Um, we understand that this, although this number might look big, just like earlier on, you know, um, they were shared that um, those billion numbers of containers might sound a big number, but this is um, relatively small because I just want to share with the audience that um, it is a, it is a, a, a multi-billion dollar problem that we have with respect to plastic waste. Um, but the industry leaders have decided that at least they could, you know, start this whole process going. And we are also um, trying to catalyze more capital as we go along, um, working with others, working with other institutions, which I'll share with you. So it's a membership organization. Um, it's set up as a 501c3 in the US. So effectively, it is a public charity. Uh, it doesn't have a mission to, um, to uh, you know, go out and make any profit at all. Um, but we, of course, are looking, just like many other organizations, to support sustainable solutions. Um, it is a thing, it is a, well, we do, you know, we do a lot of thinking, obviously, in terms of identifying where the issues are. Um, and in fact, we're quite proud of us, you know, what we call plastic circularity gaps, um, which we can share at a different time. But we are a do tank. So the Alliance pride itself in being a do tank. Um, we just don't talk about the problem. Uh, we want to be part of the solution uh, rollout, and we would fund those solution rollout. Um, so this is one, uh, probably a unique feature of the Alliance, right? So it is not just um, plastic value chain players, which makes it unique in that we understand the whole plastic production, the raw material, the, the the conversion of plastic into products, uh, but also in terms of collection waste management and um, um, and, and uh, recycling. Um, you know, talk about a, a membership. Um, a Bing's organization who spoke before me, Tomra, is also a member company of the Alliance. Next, please. So here's an, um, just an example of, you know, who are our member companies. Um, and you can see, you know, producing companies like uh, BSF, um, you know, Shell and Exxon and Chevron Phillips and Dow Chemicals. These are some of the big companies that have got together to decide that they needed to participate in the solution of plastic waste. But uh, you can also see that there are other companies there like Procter & Gamble, uh, brand owners like PepsiCo, uh, packaging companies like Henkel. Um, and of course, you know, companies like Tomra involved in uh, waste sorting and waste management um, is a member besides you know, Suez and uh, Veolia, who are, who are global uh, waste management companies. Uh, there are recycling companies also as members here, like Gemini. Um, and uh, they have all, all, well, nearly all of these companies have got, you know, basically global presence. Um, and the, the other unique feature of the alliance is that we can call on their expertise in a respective part of the value chain in order to participate in the plastic circularity challenge that we have. Uh, so not only are they contributing in terms of funds uh, to, to the Alliance, but they're also contributing expertise um, and they're contributing resources on the ground to assist with the mission of the Alliance. Um, the other point I would like to highlight is it covers across the world. You can see members from Japan like Kirin, uh, you can see members um, in Southeast Asia, like SCG in Thailand. Uh, you can see members like Reliance in India, besides the obvious one of uh, you know, American companies and, and uh, European companies. Uh, we have South American companies like Braskem. Uh, so, so we're very proud that we have global reach and global membership. Um, we have grown from 27 uh, companies now to 66 companies, and we're targeting 100 companies uh, within the next few months. Next, please. So besides those membership companies, we're working with um, important stakeholders and partners to make this work. Um, you know, organizations like ADB, um, Asia Development Bank, USAID, uh, UN uh, organizations. We also have support um, companies with the competencies in their respective area, consulting companies like Bain, BCG, um, Kearney, for example, they're offering the services in kind in order to, to participate um, in, you know, basically ending plastic waste in the environment. Next, please. So um, we work along four fronts. Um, the, 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 probably the biggest um, you know, area where we focus on is infrastructure, uh, especially in high leakage locations and areas. 
um, infrastructure is lacking. Uh, we, we understand that. Um, and we have many projects focusing on infrastructure. Um, and you know, the, the second pillar that's important that's been mentioned earlier on is innovation. Uh, we, we participate in enabling um, you know, new startups. We, we try to encourage uh, development and research capabilities on finding technical solutions. Um, but let me also stress that, you know, that is not the end of it, right? So we understand the importance of education that's been mentioned uh, by Huiling, education and um, engagement, we call it, right? Engaging with the community is also a very big part of what the Alliance would like to focus on. And finally, you, you can't just, uh, you know, look at what you might be able to do. There's a problem staring at us right now. So we also have uh, cleanup activities um, and, you know, this year, for example, we have a global program called Clean for Change, which uh, Minister Grace Fu actually helped us to launch that program globally. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, whatever solution we come up with, we want to make sure it's sustainable, it's scalable. That's very, very important, right? It's no point coming up with a solution um, that tackles a very specific part of the value chain or problem that is not replicable. So we, we want to make sure that whatever a partner or initiative we support is scalable so that we're dealing with billions of um, packages or, or plastic waste packages or billions of uh, PET bottles rather than just, you know, a few million of them, right? Because the, 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 the problem is so large. Um, catalytic, so we, we know we can't do it ourselves. We need to catalyze um, like-minded organizations, like-minded people in order to get involved in this whole process with us. And finally, we strive for circularity. Um, it is important to demonstrate that the plastic uh, cycle is not just a linear one. Um, you know, we can bring it back and turn it into a resource. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, am, am most enthusiastic about is to try and get our um, neighbors, our governments, our community to understand that waste is actually not some a problem. It is a resource. Um, and I argue that every country in the world has waste. And so therefore every country in the world has resources. You know, not, you could even call it, I wouldn't say natural resources, but net, it's resources that they actually have um, uh, to, in order to do something with it. Next, please. Yeah, Thomas, just can I, that Thomas have, uh, sorry, mindful of time. Can yeah. I can I welcome to the panel and then take some of those discussions in in the panel? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, over to you then. Uh, thank you. Uh, my apologies, but I'm a bit mindful of of the time. So I'm I'm uh, thank you all for your sharing and uh, picking up some of the uh, points that you share. I would like to structure the discussion around three main headlines. So from Huileng and Shell Olaf, I think you brought up the, the role of stakeholders. So I will, I will, this is one of the areas that we will be zooming a little bit into. Uh, the second uh, being, I like what you're saying, recycling uh, should be a rewarding journey. So uh, let's look into the value of that journey. Uh, so that will be the second stream that we'll be looking into. And Thomas, finally, I I I, uh, I got from uh, you was really interesting is is how to make it as a success by looking into, for example, those four pillars of infrastructure, innovation, engagement, and and also including the cleanup. So if we start with the role of the stakeholders, uh, Shell Olaf, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that taking back so the collection is definitely part of the equation here. Uh, how can we actually close that loop to ensure that whatever get collected also goes back into the economy? When you, when you have the DRS, you have already given the, uh, the consumer the economic incentive to come back with the empties. So I think that's the important. First step is to get the, in the in, uh, inhabitants, the consumer, the reason to take back the packaging material into the system and then of course it's important because the Norwegian legislation quoted as everyone selling a product are obliged to take it back so then you know that even a kiosk or gasoline station if you bought a, a bottle with beverage you can go in and deposit deliver it back get rid of it immediately so that's give the efficiency 
So I think that, and this is regulated by the authority in Norway, and I think this is a good idea to say that everyone that sells product should be a part of the take back system to help make it easy for the consumer to deliver back whatever you have into the system. Bing, what would be your view? Yes, um, I can only add to Shalula that um, the material that goes through NDRS, um, it can be easily um, recycled already using existing technology of today because the quality is so high um, and the contamination rate is typically low. So what is needed after the collection process is that you need an efficient logistics, right? The logistics, um, as Shalula will know, actually accounts for a large part of the total cost related to NDRS. So typically, if you can re um, utilize reverse logistics, etc., this will be very beneficial beneficial. And then the next step clearly is that you will actually need to have cap capacity to recycle the material. And, and as, as of now, we know that Singapore actually don't have any domestic PET recycling plant. So Tomra also support work um, to really examine whether there could be possibility to establish local uh, recycling capabilities. Also knowing that this is clearly one of the ambitions behind the Singaporean DRS. Um, the final point I would like to stress is that, yes, you have then the material, it's recycled, but then you need to actually find offtake for it, right? Um, and we know that the recycling market can be volatile because it is affected by uh, price of virgin material uh, and also in general investment sentiment. So one effective tool that actually the government uh, can help um, to, to intervene is to set minimum recycled content targets to actually ensure that the producers, they will put a minimum amount of recycled material into their packaging. So one example is EU's uh, single-use plastic directive, uh, where they mandate that by 2025, all plastic PET beverage bottles needs to have minimum 25% recycled content increasing to 30% by 2030. And we also see that several bottle bill states in US, they have also done the same. Um, and this could be also some uh, path to follow, for example, for Singapore. Wilang, based on, uh, on your advocacy role, the zero, zero waste, are we ready as consumer? Um, that's an interesting question, Corrado. I've been thinking about that. Uh, so. I think on paper, the deposit refund scheme is something that, that ought to work, right? Uh, you have, you know, the, the, the consumers, you know, paying up front, maybe a premium a little bit more, uh, with the expectation that when they, they return the, the, uh, the product, they get back their deposit. And so it's really no cost in that sense uh, to, to consumers. But I think um, in Singapore, what we're really used to are cash for trash schemes or our uh, you know, current uh, reverse vending machine. And what this does is really, you know, there's no uh, increase in the cash outlay that uh, consumers have, but, they, but, but if they bring it back to, you know, these collection points, then they get, you know, either a, a credit or, or some kind of monetary reward. So in that sense, then the deposit refund scheme really becomes an incentive scheme, you know, do it or, or not, but you still pay the same retail price in that, in that, in that sense. And um, I think we all know that uh, incentives are, a little less effective than when you know you you have skin in the game and and uh, the whole ecosystem works in in unison. But I would say that you know having a scheme like uh, the deposit refund scheme that's a a really elegant design in really helping motivate the right the right uh, behavior. So it starts all the way just to add on to. Uh, uh, Shell's Olaf point and as well as Bing's point. I think you know when you have a scheme that is uh, about. Uh, collecting recyclables that uh, is a dedicated a waste stream that is a single type of recyclable and you have a scheme that is rolled out uh, full scale where the infrastructure is there uh, you get both you know maybe cleaner recyclables the rate of our recycling contamination is really high and that's why we have a low recycling rate um, so you know with this dedicated scheme you get something cleaner you also get maybe um, critical mass to be able to, you know, build capacity, be able to roll it out in a larger way and for it to really uh, take, 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 take hold in Singapore. So yeah, that's one part, you know, mechanisms aside, 
uh, it's really uh, how it can then influence uh, consumer behavior to help. I think consumers themselves have to also make a stand. We definitely have um, the collective power uh, or ideas, actions to really have, you know, to, to, to signal to the market, hey, you know, we're actually ready. We're ready to co-share responsibility, you know, ready to, to change the way that we behave, the way that we deal with our trash. Yeah, you levy the charge on us, uh, but we'll bring it back to you. Uh, with full expectations that then you will return us the, the, the deposits. I think um, really it's about market signaling and, and being ready to, to make that change. It's a mindset change, it's a habit change. And of course, then it has got to be supported by, by, by education, by campaigns, by, by really raising public awareness. So yeah, I think and that's the whole. Yeah, so because I, I also got from every of your insight and sharing that this collabor collaboration across different stakeholders is key. So definitely, definitely, as a consumer, we do play a part. Uh, Thomas, uh, you, you mentioned the cleanup pillar. Uh, just thinking about this stakeholder's role uh, on, on the ERS and, and picking on Hui Leng's point uh, about this clean recycling economy, can you imagine the ERS being expanded to other materials? Uh, well, be, well, besides... Um, besides, besides PG, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think there's a plan actually to address that broader challenge of other types of plastic waste in the uh, extended producer responsibility. I think we talked about packaging. Um, so, so I think uh, to answer your question, uh, Corrado, uh, I think Singapore has already got a plan uh, to introduce EPR for packaging, which includes, of course, um, plastic waste. Um, you know, by 2025, I think that's the timeline. Um, so I hope that, you know, answers your question. Yes. Um, and indeed, you know, the challenge actually, if I may say so, is not so much um, a PET when it comes to plastic waste, because plastic waste, PET, you know, you've got a DRS system that has been demonstrated in many locations. The challenge is actually the low value plastic waste. Um, you know, the flexibles, the multi-layers, the single use uh, plastic bags and all those um, those difficult to collect and difficult to segregate type of plastic waste. Thanks, Thomas. If we should move into the uh, question around recycling being a, a rewarding journey, uh, being is there an appropriate level for that reward? I know that the Tomra has done some studies, so can you share a little bit your insights? Right, yes. So clearly, I guess um, uh, we need to be clear on why bother, right, to, to kind of look at this um, value of this refund or deposit. I would just only refrain from using the word fee, because clearly this is not the cost to a consumer. This is, this is kind of a reward that will be returned to them when they actually do their part to return the bottle. So let me just use the word refund, deposit inter interchangeably. Uh, but clearly the reason why we bother is that there is a clear correlation between the deposit value um, and the return rate you get, right? And the collection rate or the return rate in every DRS is probably the most important um, success criteria for it. Um, so we, when we look at um, deposit value, typically we look at kind of three key factors. It needs to be meaningful. Um, so it should reflect the purchasing power of the, every country and then make the consumers feel that it's actually worthwhile to return. And then secondly, it should be set at a um, high enough um, value to actually motivate, uh, say, up to 90% return rates, which is often the kind of the, the standard for, for a highly successful um, DRS. Uh, while not to be too high, uh, and then in that case, that could potentially encourage fraud. Um, and then it should also be set at the rate that motivates return, not only now, today, but also, say, in five years or 10 years from now to make the DRS a future-proof solution. So very quickly on kind of how we have recommended then a potential minimum value for Singapore, then we have basically looked at different factors. Um, 
um, comparing uh, existing jurisdictions uh, against the hypothetical deposit values in Singapore. Um, so the factors we've looked at has been um, basically the deposit value measured um, in kind of a standard equal term. So using international dollars, then against, of course, the return rates. So typically then we, we see a clear pattern. The, the deposit value needs to be minimum certain amount in order to get up to 90% return rates. We have also then looked at the deposit value um, against some uh, typical product prices and also um, counting, um, counting for different material types. So PET, uh, aluminum cans, they, they can have different um, value or, or for example, different sizes of beverages. Um, and inspired by the Big Mac index, <laughs> we have also actually looked at deposit um, then um, as percentage of the price of Coca-Cola in, in several markets. So basically, um, after doing this quick and dirty um, exercise, then we have come up with the recommended minimum amount of deposit value for Singapore to be minimum 15 uh, thing dollar uh, cent. So you might say that, you know, 15 cent is probably too high or maybe too low. Now, obviously, there are, this is not exact science, but I think, and, and maybe, you know, the, the panelist here, you can claim that, you know, you would return anyway, right? And because you are diligent enough and, and you care about um, our planet. But I think it's important for us to remember that the DRS should be for everyone. And in order for us to, um, you know, um, to, to really uh, encourage up to 90% return rate, this then uh, could be the suggested value from our side. Thanks, Ben. Thomas, can I pick your brain and uh, uh, get your view? Who should deposit this value first if, if, if we're introducing the $50 cent? Sorry, I said 15, so yeah, one 15. five. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I was just, <laughs> there has been some inflation in the last few seconds. <laughs> Corrado, you always give me the difficult question. So I'm, I'm going to have to address it slightly differently. Um, one of the things, in, you know, before going to that question is, is to highlight that as the Alliance, because we are a registered public charity, we don't really advocate or, or lobby for any um, legislation. I just want to be clear. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, talking about DRS, we are, we are okay to talk about DRS so long as, you know, that specific government has already decided to implement it, right? So it's, it's something that's sort of a reaction rather than to to advocate for something. What I do want to say is that the Alliance feel that um, we need to create value for recyclers. So, you know, how do you create value? Once you create value for it, there's a demand, right? So there's a demand in the marketplace. We feel that as, as an organization, we can concentrate and put some effort into creating those values so that it, it, it permeates itself, right, in, in, into the, the, the usual marketplace. So we actually have a thematic um, a group of people working on this theme of creating value for recyclers. At the same time, we also have a group of people working on what we call design for circularity. So, so talk about you know, plastic circularity, the circular economy. Um, there is a, a tremendous amount of effort that goes into make sure that whatever we design for, whether it is the multi-layer packaging uh, material or whether it is a certain type of um, material that plastic material has been used uh, for packaging, we, we think about circularity right at the beginning. Um, now back to back to your question, Corrado, which I honestly find it very difficult to answer because I'm not an expert in the DRS um, topic. Um, I do understand that somebody or some party or some collection of organizations may have to look at how do you get this going um, at, right at the start. Um, and Quite frankly, I will have to I will have to skip this uh, answer uh, question. Because yeah, but I, then, I then if allow if you allow me, then I will ask Shell Olaf, uh, who should manage that value? Should we should we take the example and, and use Norway as as the way of managing that collected value? I think at least in Norway, uh, the level of the the deposit is set by the authority. And there's one good reason. Back in time, I argued that that should be Infinitum's job to decide. But then I found that it's very difficult to inline producer and retailer uh, and uh, manage them to agree at the same time because they are always afraid 
that the increase in deposit will decrease the sales of the product. Luckily, uh, we had the same deposit value for over 30 years until 2018. Then the politician decided they want to double from one to two Norwegian Chrome. I'm not sure what that uh, is in uh, Singapore value, but still it's a double. And then we go up from 85% uh, deposit rate to 92. So it's obvious that you need to have the right level. And it's also costly to adjust the deposit value. So you, you won't do it too often because you have to change the barcodes and so on. It's not very difficult, but it com comes with a cost. So you should do it um, maybe every 10 years or something. So, but I think if you look into the experience and all the data that Tomra has, it's not that difficult to find a level that should be okay. And the deposit should be for everyone. Uh, and uh, the experience also in Norway, when we doubled the, um, the deposit value, it had nothing to say for the sales because the people was already used to deposit and been there for a hundred years. So I think that's important and not be too afraid. It's, it's uh, more difficult if you, if you set it too low than too high because people that need the money, they will quickly learn that, okay, I get my money back next time I buy a product. So the total amount uh, of money that uh, are stuck when you have the empties at home is at very low level. You can increase the frequency of the uh, deposit if that's an issue for a household. So we see that and we also see that low income family because we can look into product that we know are mostly sell to, sold to low income family. We have a much higher deposit rate. And that's interesting because then we see that those guys then need to get their money back. So they will take care of all the empties. So, and then you see the older age product that's for young people, the, the cool ones, you have a lower deposit rate. So then you need to have a higher deposit. So, yeah. but we can prove in 2018, we had changed it and you saw a huge increase. And that has a lot to say for the environmental impact when they managed to go up to 92, 93% deposit rate as we are at that, that time. Yeah. Yeah, which is, which is the highest among all the countries having a refund system. Eh? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huilang, uh, to the to, to the third stream uh, for for those questionings on how to contribute to making DRS a success. Um, how do you think that Singapore can actually go out and influence uh, other neighboring countries uh, once the DRS is implemented? What do you think will happen next? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, thanks for the sharing so far. I'm also learning and I think a lot of points have already been uh, made by the my fellow panelists. I, I thought uh, one of the interesting things to highlight would be, you know, if we wanted it to be large scale, we wanted it to be effective, um, the authorities would probably need to come in uh, for legislation to, to even level the playing field. I think on two fronts, level the playing field so that, uh, you know, everyone so, so have to pay the same deposit or uh, you know all retailers have to charge that amount. Uh, the other is really to provide the infrastructure. How do we um, you know have waste uh, how can authorities work with waste collectors to put up more collection points so that's easy for the public to do it. You know sometimes it's not that you don't have the intention of wanting to do it, you just can't find <laughs> the collection points to do the deposit. So I think you know if we wanted to roll this out, want to make it successful, the authorities have to come in. Um, but that is only um, maybe 80% of the work because I think that it will cover the broad strokes and uh, the large spectrum of consumers and communities. But uh, you probably, and this is not a plug for my NGO or whatever, but um, I think you do need um, you know, specialized groups, niche groups to actually come and, and work with maybe corporates who, who are a bit smaller, who maybe can't uh, fit or comply with a, a templated kind of uh, legislation or you need to work with community groups you know, as, as being, or Shell or Allah said, uh, you know, low-income groups, maybe, you know, in our context, they are the ones who get first hit because their disposable income might take a hit if you put a, a charge uh, and, and, and uh, so on and so forth. So I think smaller and niche groups, uh, you probably need uh, an NGO to come in or, or really have someone to work uh, specially with them. So, you know, if we get this right, I think then how can we scale up and then maybe share us as a successful case study uh, to the rest of Southeast Asia or Asia? I think it's two points again. Um, I think we have a lot of a networks and partnerships. So, so a lot of them, you know, the usual platforms and forums. But I think where we also uh, have expertise in is in, uh, you know, uh, the technologies 
to recycle. Uh, yeah, we don't have a plan now, but, but that is something that we are building up uh, our technologies and capabilities in plastic recycling. Uh, we also have a very good infrastructure system, a waste management infrastructure system. I think um, that's where we can share our expertise and really help uh, our neighbours uh, you know, if, if they, they, they want to go down the route of also uh, implementing a DRS, um, so these are the probably the areas that, that, that we can share with. Thank you, Hui Leng. And unless there are questions from the audience. I think I will, I will ask the last question to uh, all of you, which is a little bit the same as to Hui Leng. So I'm curious to get a very quick uh, Shalola Bing Thomas in, in one, two words, what does it take to make the DRS successful so that we can actually have this clean recycling economy via DRS? Shalola. <laughs> two words, that's difficult. But I think in Norway, the politician, they set up a very efficient uh, regulation with the environmental cost model. So they didn't say that they needed the policy system. It was up to the industry to find the most efficient solution. My experience is that uh, with my board representing retail and producer, we have a very efficient dialogue because we always focus how to make the system better and to take in new products into the system. So we have extended it for new products as well. So I think good political decision, say that we want a cost-efficient uh, collection system and then let the industry uh, look into it because the industry is very good at innovation if they just get the right uh, insights from the politicians. Thank you. Thomas? Um, learn from others. I mean, this is not the first time that uh, any uh, country or any jurisdiction is doing DRS, right? So learn from others. Um, there are success stories. There are also less good success stories and these are good things that you put together and um, test whether or not it works in your environment and the other thing i would say is be to be determined um, which i know singapore is very very good at so you know once you set your mind to it you know determined to do it learn from others put in your best practice and it will work you know have confidence and faith that it will work and it will change i think um, the mindset of you know all of us in terms of our, our role in recycling plastic. Bing? Thank you for giving me the pleasure to conclude. So I would like to summarize using uh, four key principles. The first one being performance. It's all about uh, driving high return rates. The second, convenience. So how to actually make the return um, easy for the consumers. Where do you place uh, accessible, available return points? Um, the third is producer responsibility. It needs to be based on EPR, but also having an efficient, balanced funding source. And finally, system integrity. So this system should be transparent. Uh, it should also have clear uh, divided roles and responsibilities. Thank you, Bing. We have one question. Shell, Olaf, if you can take it very quickly, and then we conclude. Yeah, so a question about if you're running curbside as well as DRS, and that's yes. So we have both systems in Norway, and we actually compete. Uh, so most of the producers want to have a uh, deposit mark and join the deposit system, but you can sell a PT or a can in Norway without deposit and use the curbside system. So that's right. Thank you. And then for all the other questions that we are, com that are coming in, we will be uh, capturing those and, and reply and attend those uh, uh, afterwards. I would like to conclude. Thank you to my panelists and thank you to Professor Seram. Uh, I learned a lot today, so I will like to conclude thanking you all and please take, it, take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.